Hi, I'm Jack Ansel. Welcome to the Embedded Muse video blog, a companion to my free Embedded Muse newsletter. Today I'm going to be talking about electromagnetics in general, but in particular why firmware people have to have some understanding of this field. That's right, people doing the software inside embedded systems really need to have some sense of what's going on in high-speed digital systems. I'll be teaching some electronics. Don't worry, it's not complicated. It's pretty interesting and it's way cool. I know some of you folks are electrical en engineers and suffered through those electromagnetic courses. I thought those two classes were going to kill me. I had no idea what they were talking about, but we learned to do circular integrals and all kinds of complicated math that to this day I still don't understand. If you, like me, have forgotten this stuff, you need this book, High Speed Digital Design. It's also subtitled A Handbook of Black Magic by Martin Graham and Howard Johnson. It's the best reference on the market. But if you open it up, you may be very afraid. It's full of math. The trick to getting useful information from this book is to not read the formulas. Just read the prose. The authors do an excellent job of explaining these concepts in ways that the practicing engineer can really use. For those of you who are doublees, do you remember this formula? Now, I have purposely put this up incorrectly, that B on the left-hand side of the equality sign should be E. And if it were, that would be Faraday's law, one of Maxwell's famous laws. Uh, that would relate the electric field to the magnetic field. And the reason I put it up there incorrectly is to really make a point that most of us have forgotten this stuff. Let's look at some real signals. These are both obviously square waves. In this case, they're running at one megahertz. The top waveform is for square wave with a transition time from zero volts to three volts of 20 nanoseconds. 20 nanoseconds to make this switch. The bottom waveform is the same one megahertz square wave, but in this case the transition time from zero to three volts is one nanosecond. It's a much faster rise time. But clearly we can see that there's this oddball ringing going on, and this ringing is the entire focus of my discussion today. The square wave's frequency is given right here. You can see it's one megahertz. Now watch as I change that frequency. I'm going to make it slower and slower and slower and slower. We're down to 80 kilohertz. Here's 50 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz. You'll notice that the signal hasn't changed at all. I'm gonna, just to illustrate this, I'm gonna go back up in frequency. You can see the ringing has not changed in the slightest bit. Only the frequency of the waveform is changing. And that's the first point I want to make today. Everyone talks about digital systems as being fast by looking at the clock rate. You know, we talk about that three gigahertz clock rate on your Pentium processor, and, and yeah, that is fast. But when it comes to electromagnetic issues, the clock rate is practically irrelevant. What we really care about is the transition time, the time to go from a zero to a one, or a one back to a zero again. As we just saw, I changed the clock rate by several orders of magnitude, and the ringing didn't change at all. What's that ringing about? Where does it come from? Well, what happens is when a signal goes down a wire or a track on a printed circuit board, when it hits the receiver, if the impedance, which impedance is nothing more than the AC resistance, it's measured in ohms, it's just like a resistor, except that it has a frequency component, as we'll see in a little bit. As it hits the receiver, if the impedance of that receiver does not exactly match the impedance of the driver, some of the signal will be reflected back. Of course, it goes back and hits the driver, there's an impedance mismatch, and it gets reflected back. Bing, bing, bing. And that's that ringing that we saw on the oscilloscope. There is one formula in that book which is really important, and that's this. If TR is the rise time of the signal, the time to transition from a zero to a one, measured in nanoseconds, then any frequency above F, given by this formula, will be so far down, on the order of 40 decibels down, that it's not going to be important. So if a signal has a 20 nanosecond rise time, like one of the signals we just looked at, then even if your clock rate is a lousy one hertz, your board looks like a 25 me megahertz system. 20 nanoseconds is <laughs> really slow. It's hard to build systems that slow anymore. One nanosecond is more typical of rise times. Again, if you are building a system with a one hertz clock and the signals are transitioning in one nanosecond, 
your board looks like a 500 megahertz board with all the problems that are associated with a 500 megahertz board. That book is subtitled The Handbook of Black Magic and sometimes it really does seem like black magic but this is real physical stuff. I'll give you an example. Some time ago a company contacted me. they have been making 4 megahertz Z80 boards for 30 years. had never had a problem. They had a new batch of boards manufactured. None of them worked. So we looked at them. Everything was the same. All the part numbers were the same. Nothing was different. Turns out the IC vendors figured no one's going to complain if they make their parts faster than advertised. Those logic components that used to switch in 15 nanoseconds were now switching in 5. So suddenly their little old slow board had all these high frequency components running around all over the board. They had to redesign that board as a high speed digital board with ground planes and all the other things that we do in order to make these systems reliable. Now if you remember any electromagnetics and for you firmware people who probably weren't exposed to it at all, there was a dude named Fourier a couple of hundred years ago who showed that any periodic signal, any signal that repeats, can be represented as a sum of sine waves. So for example the square waves that we just looked at, that can be represented as a sum of sine waves of different frequencies and different amplitudes. And it turns out for a square wave the odd harmonics are the ones that are included. In other words it's going to be the sine of the base frequency plus the sine of three times the base frequency plus the sine of five times the base frequency, etc. Turns out there's a tool we can use to help us visualize this. It's called a spectrum analyzer and you may not have one of those but pretty much any digital oscilloscope today can simulate a spectrum analyzer by computing the Fourier transform, again going back to Mr. Fourier, of an, an input signal. Turning back to the scope again, the first trace is a display of a 50 megahertz sine wave. As you can see it looks very nice, very nice and clean. It's coming out of my, my signal generator and as is typical on a scope, the vertical axis is voltage, the horizontal axis is time. So it's voltage versus time. I've told the scope on this bottom display to display the Fourier transform of that sine wave. And what this axis is, is frequency. So we have amplitude here, that they don't measure it in volts, it's measured in decibels, decibels related to volts, but it's frequency across the bottom here. And sure enough, the center peak is centered at 50 megahertz because that's the signal that I'm putting into the oscilloscope. And yeah, there's a lot of noise, you can ignore that. But as I tune the signal generator, I'm increasing the frequency. You can see the sine wave frequency going up and you can see the Fourier transform being shifted to the right. Or if I reduce the frequency, it gets shifted to the left. That's what a spectrum analyzer is all about. That's what fast Fourier transforms do. And now we'll use this to illustrate what's really going on with the electromagnetics. So this top waveform is that one megahertz square wave we looked at earlier. And in this case, this is the slow one. The transition time is 20 nanoseconds. On the bottom display, we're looking at the Fourier transform of this one megahertz square wave. And sure enough, the biggest peak right here is just what you'd expect it to be. It's at 1 megahertz because that's the fundamental frequency we're talking about. But because Mr. Fourier taught us that the square wave can be represented as a sum of sine waves of different frequencies, and in the case of square waves, those are always odd multiples of the fundamental, this is at 3 megahertz, 5 megahertz, 7 megahertz. Look, here we are out at 21 megahertz out there, and we still have a significant amount of energy in the waveform. Now we're looking at that 1 megahertz square wave with a really fast rise time, 1 nanosecond. And in this case, here's the 1 megahertz peak where most of the energy is. And you can see that the, the sine wave coefficients fall off in magnitude. But even way out here, we're talking about 180 megahertz. In other words, there's a significant amount of energy being released at 180 megahertz. And that's what electromagnetics is all about. So how do we fix this rigging problem? Well, I've already given you a clue. The problem is that the impedances of the receiver and the driver are not matched. So obviously the solution is to match the impedance. And there are many ways we can do this. One of which is to use a resistor network. Two resistors configured just as shown here. Let's see what happens. So if I match the impedance by putting that resistor network on, look how that signal gets cleaned up. 
just from two little resistors takes out most of that energy. Not all of it, nothing's perfect, but it does a pretty darn good job. Why would a firmware person care about this stuff? After all, you're not doing the electronics, you're doing your firmware. Well, as a, in the process of debugging your code, you're going to be probing the board in all kinds of mysterious ways, probably with oscilloscopes and logic analyzers and who knows what else. Every time you put a probe on a node, you'll be changing the impedance of that node because a probe is not a perfect device. It has an impedance of its own. So as you change the impedance of the node, you will create the ringing, the overshoot problems that we have seen. So from a firmware perspective, I think it's very important that you are aware of this because you don't want the act of probing the board to cause the board to suddenly fail. How can it fail? Catastrophically. You saw that how big that ringing, ringing is. If that ringing goes much above the power supply, which is very easy to do, then the devices, the ICs on your board can go into what's called SCR latch up. And all that means is they're trying to connect power to ground inside the chip. And they can do that for like a microsecond before things burn up. And again, it sounds like black magic, right? Well, years ago when I was in the emulator business, we built our first of a whole new generation of emulators. It was a dead slow device. It was six megahertz. These things would be inserted in place of the CPU on people's boards. But we drove those signals very fast because that's what our customers wanted us to do. And we tested this first new product on all of our test platforms and everything was perfect. We sent it to the first customer and he plugged it into his board. And I'm not making this up. Every chip on his board exploded. The plastic blew apart on the chips. This guy was pretty ticked. But that's, it's a very real effect. So I recommend that at least on prototypes, you firmware people make sure that your hardware folks put some sort of termination network on critical signals like the ones that are being displayed right now that you're likely to be probing frequently. These are signals that tend to be very sensitive to the very least amount of ringing and overshoot. So a handful of resistors and you can solve all of those problems. In the last few minutes we've seen how the black magic of high speed edges can cause probing problems in embedded systems both for hardware and for software people. But wait, there's more. In the next video, we'll look at exactly what's going on inside of these probes, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out lots more videos and over a thousand articles about building embedded systems over at ganzel.com.